Welcome back. Um, so we'll uh, continue where we stopped. So uh, chapter eight, we were looking at uh, the giving, right? So uh, two things that uh, Paul asked the believers is, uh, or he asked them to notice about the Macedonian church in their giving was that they gave in spite of their poverty and uh, they gave in a way that Christ himself had given of himself to the church. Uh, where, uh, we see in Philippians 2, 5 to 8, let this mind of Christ be uh, in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a burden servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Um, and so we see where Christ himself emptied uh, and gave himself fully for us. And uh, in that same way, uh, where the Macedonian church was giving uh, out of a place of uh, not that they were having abundance, but even in their poverty, they were able to give uh, to the church in Jerusalem. Um, <clears throat> so we go on from there um, to those last few verses that we were looking at. Uh, so the last verse, verse 15 says, He who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Uh, now that is a reference to Exodus 16, uh, 16 to 18, where, uh, where the Israelites are instructed to go out and uh, collect their manna for each day. Uh, right? And this is the instruction that's given to them. If someone can read Exodus 16, this is 16 to 18, please. Exodus chapter 16, verses uh, 16 to 18. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, that every man gather it according to each one's need. One omer for each person according to the number of persons, that every man take for those who are in his tent. Then the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more, some less. So when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered according to each one's need. Uh, so the principle here is important, right? So each of them had as much as they needed. Um, and if we see in verse 16 where uh, God commands them, he says, gather as much as you need, take an omer for each person you have in your tent. So God had given them a specific quantity that they were supposed to take for each person. Um, so they were not going to go collect as much as they could or they were not going to collect uh, collect uh, any amount of food for each person. They had a specific amount. God knew how much each person needed. And so if there were five people in a family, they had five omers. Three people in a family, they had three omers. So to say that you take as much as your family needs. Uh, and so the same principle is what Paul uh, is talking about here church or uh, each believer should have as much as they need uh, so that there is equality within the church. So uh, don't give more than, uh, than you can give. So don't reduce your, uh, your uh, whatever you possess to the extent that you have a lack. Uh, and you're giving so much to others. Rather, give, uh, keep as much as you need, and give, give to others out of the excess or um, 
whatever extra is there to uh, share with others. And that is the goal, to have equality. Um, another thing, uh, if someone can read Ephesians 4, 15 to 16. Ephesians 4, 16. Uh, 15 and 16. Okay. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effect effective working by which every part does its share, causing growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Amen. Thank you. So uh, we see in Ephesians 4 uh, where um, Paul talks about the church being like a physical body and each part brings something to supply to the rest of the body. Uh, each part does its share. Each part contributes to the growing of the body uh, and for the growth of love within the body. Uh, so in that same way, um, we look at this, uh, this teaching on giving is that uh, each each local body also supports one another so that uh, we are all growing together as the body of Christ. And we are all growing in love. We are all growing towards Christ's likeness. And we're all able to share and build each other up. Uh, so that's the beautiful thing about these churches as well is that they were so connected to one another, although they were in completely different uh, paths of uh, geographically, uh, they were still connected because these apostles were traveling across uh, to the different churches and they could vouch for the churches, uh, they could speak on their behalf, they could share their needs. Um, so we go on from here, verses 16 to 24, if someone could read that for us, please. Second Corinthians chapter 8 verses 16 to 24. But thanks be to God who puts the same earnest care for you in the hearts of Titus. For he not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you of his own accord. And if we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel, throughout all the churches, and not only that, but who was also chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift, which is administered by us to the glory of Lord himself, and to show your ready mind. Avoiding this, that anyone should blame us in this lavish gift which is administered by us, providing honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. Until and we have sent with them our brother, whom we have often pro proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent because of the great confidence which we have in you. If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. Or if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Therefore, show to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of your boasting on your behalf. Uh, so uh, here uh, Paul just kind of concludes this part about the uh, giving and talks about the people who will be coming to receive the funds from them. Uh, so uh, first he talks about Titus in verses uh, 16 and 17. Uh, so uh, Titus as somebody who cares for the church, uh, not um, someone who is going there because he's being forced or being sent, uh, but he willingly wants to go. He wants to go see them. And uh, in seeing them and being with them, uh, to be able to carry these funds back. Um, and then 
verses 18 uh, and 19. He talks about uh, somebody who was sent by the churches to travel. So uh, in doing this, he is basically saying these people can be trusted. I'm introducing them and uh, I'm telling you who they are, the authority that they're coming with, so that uh, when you're giving, you know that you're giving to trustworthy people right and uh, that they will take it to the church there won't be any uh, misuse of the money there won't be any loss of the money that you have given um so verse 18 we have sent within the brother whose praise is in the gospel so uh, this uh, in the niv it says praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel so uh, we don't have his name but we have this recommendation that paul gives as he has served for the sake of the gospel and uh, recognized through all the churches. Um, and so he has been sent. He was chosen by the church in Jerusalem itself to uh, travel with them and to take this gift uh, that was being given. Uh, in the end of verse 19, uh, administered by us to the glory of the Lord himself and to show your ready mind. So this gift is uh, being given for the glory of God. Right? Uh, while we're doing all of these things, we're giving sacrificially, we're uh, giving generously, it's always for the glory of the Lord. Uh, and to show that we are ready to give, uh, that uh, we have a willingness to share, we have a willingness to uh, bless others in need. And then verse 20, um, avoiding this, that anyone should blame us in this gift, that is administered by us. So uh, verses 20 and 21 is uh, just to say they have been put in charge of administering this gift, right? Of collecting it from the churches, of uh, gathering that money together, of uh, talking to the churches, raising up people who will uh, get these funds, who will uh, do all that. Uh, but then they want to do all of that in a way that is blameless that nobody uh, can question the way they've handled their finances. Um, and so the way they do it in verse 21, he says, providing honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of, the, of men. So being very careful in the way they are doing it so that nobody can question how they've handled these funds. Uh, this is very important. Uh, as we also deal with finances in ministry, uh, that we do it with such wisdom, uh, that there's always, uh, in the way we are handling it, uh, there's always transparency, there's no uh, confusion about where did the money go, how did we deal with it. So when people are giving money to us, how are we uh, accountable to them? How are we uh, reporting to them where the money went, how it was used, uh, who who used it, all of those things. Having that kind of openness about the way the money is being used or uh, how the money is being taken care of and then having accountability uh, to be able to uh, report about how how we have uh, used the funds that people have given. So this is something that we shouldn't take lightly, uh, especially in ministry, uh, because we want people to know that we are in ministry for Christ's sake. We are not there for the money. We are not there uh, to, uh, to get rich or to uh, promote ourselves in any way. Right? And if people can trust us and can see that our motives are pure, uh, then they can trust the ministry that we are doing. But if we don't have these kinds of practices in place where we are uh, taking care of what God has entrusted to us, then uh, it's very easy that our funds get misappropriated, even if we are not doing it. Uh, if that transparency, that accountability is not there in our ministry, somebody else who comes on board can easily misuse money. So have good processes in place, uh, have clear communication with those we are ministering to, uh, that there will be no hindrance to the work that we are doing. And finances or questions of doubt or misuse of funds will not come, um, come in the way of what we are doing in serving God and serving people. 
and then verses 22 to 24, uh, we have sent with them our brother whom we have uh, we have often proved diligent. So along with Titus and this other brother who was sent by the churches, there's one more brother being sent. Uh, and he, here he's saying he's proved to be diligent. Uh, and uh, so we're sending him to you along with them. And then he, uh, 23 and 24, he says, OK, if somebody has questions about these three people uh, and wonders, can we give them money? Or who are they? What authority do they, do they have? Can we trust them? He is saying what you can answer about these three people. So Titus is Paul's partner and fellow worker concerning you. So uh, he's a partner and fellow worker uh, with Paul in serving the church of Corinth. Um, and then the brethren who are going with them are messengers from the church, have been sent by the church itself. Uh, and then uh, and then he says, so show them your love, uh, prove your love and are boasting on their behalf. So honor them, respect them, take care of them because uh, they are people you can trust. They are people we have trusted and sent to you. Um, <clears throat> And just one important description here in verse 23, the church is the glory of Christ. Uh, so uh, just uh, a reminder that that is what the church is called to be, the revelation of the glory of Christ, uh, which is a really powerful, beautiful description of what we are called to be as a church. We go on to chapter 9 from here. Um, someone can read verses 1 to 5. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 to 5. Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness, about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that as I said, you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we not to mention you should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift before and which you had previously promised that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Uh, so here, um, Paul is uh, kind of concluding all of these arrangements about collecting the funds. Uh, and just as he has used the Macedonians as an example for the Corinthians to follow, he's also used the Corinthian church to encourage the Macedonians. Uh, so looking, this is something uh, we can learn is to look at other believers who exemplify uh, faith or strong faith in Christ while living out a uh, faith that uh, is worth emulating and to be encouraged and stirred up to follow their example. Uh, that's what Paul is doing here. So encouraging one church with the other church's example. Uh, so he says in verse 2, uh, I boasted about you to the Macedonians, uh, saying that you were already ready a year ago uh, and, and uh, that your passion, your excitement, your zeal for giving uh, has actually stirred up many people to give. Um, and so uh, we see Achaia here referring to that region, right? So telling uh, the region in Macedonia, the churches in Macedonia about the region of Achaia, that they were ready to give. Um, and then verse 3, 
so even though you were already ready a year ago, I've sent uh, these brethren, that is Titus and the two brothers, uh, because we don't want our posting, so we want you to be ready. So you had spoken about it. You had. Uh, we don't know if they had already started the process of collecting, but so that the process would be completed, all the funds would be brought together, and they would be ready to give uh, when it was time for them to actually um, for Paul to actually go and collect the money. Uh, so he doesn't want them to be unprepared uh, if he takes them as Donians there that whatever he had been talking about them would prove to be uh, something that was untrue. Uh, and then the last part, he says, uh, we want your giving to be out of a willing heart and not a grudging obligation. So uh, Titus and those brothers have come there to prepare you so that you can make a decision and give uh, according to your willingness, uh, rather than us coming when it's time to collect and then you feel forced to give at that time. Uh, and you don't give it with a willing heart. You don't give it with uh, with a thought beforehand of how much you want to give and giving with that kind of uh, intentionality uh, so that is something uh, also for us to learn where we are giving uh, with generosity but we're giving uh, willingly and cheerfully not uh, out of any feeling of obligation uh, with uh, holding any grudges against people feeling like we are forced to give that should never be the way we are asking for funds or the way we are giving funds as well um, move on from here to verses 6 to 15. Maybe we'll split that up. Uh, we'll just do 6 to 9 for now. Someone can read that. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also be bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have an all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work, as it is written. He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Thank you. So uh, here we see Paul just talking a little bit about how we should give. Um, and uh, so he begins uh, with saying that if we sow a little bit, we will reap a little bit using the example of a farmer. But if you sow more, uh, you can look forward to a greater harvest. Uh, so likening that to how we bless others, uh, we are sowing into their lives and what comes out of that uh, will be a great harvest. Um, and then, and we can share in that harvest. Uh, so we can share, we can rejoice in that harvest. Um, so that is regarding how much to give. Then he talks about how to give in verse 7. And he says, not uh, like we read in the previous verses, uh, not with a sense of necessity, not uh, like you're being forced to give, uh, but to give cheerfully uh, with a heart that is willing, with a heart that desires to give. Um, and then he, verse 8 says how not to give. Um, uh, verse 7, sorry, he says uh, you should not give grudgingly and you should not give out of any sense of pressure, whether it's from the leadership or from the other church members or even feeling a sense of obligation towards a person in need. It should never be from that place of pressure. Uh, it should be from your own heart that is willing. Um, and so Paul's, uh, this, uh, what he does to send them ahead of time is a very, very important thing because he's not pressuring them to give immediately, right? So a lot of uh, sales in our day is kind of this, 
make an immediate decision. This discount will end in 15 minutes or will end today. And so they put that kind of pressure on you to make a decision and to feel like, OK, I'm going to lose out on this if I don't uh, if I do not do it today, if I don't do it right now. So all takes away that kind of time pressure. They have time to think about it. They have time to process it, to make a decision as they within their own hearts or with their families, uh, and then give uh, a very good example of how uh, we can we can encourage people to give as well when we are uh, when we want to raise funds, want to give money for whatever it is, uh, to have that kind of attitude, to not adopt the methods and means the world uses to pressurize people, uh, rather to adopt the ways uh, that we see in scripture from people of God. Um, and then we see Luke uh, Luke six thirty eight is where Jesus talks about giving. He says, "Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you." Uh, so the same principle of uh, the more you give, the more you will be blessed. The more will be given to you. Uh, so Paul is kind of speaking in line with that uh, kind of thinking. Um, <clears throat> so verse 8, he says, uh, he will make all grace abound to you, that in all sufficiency you may have an abundance for every good work. So he's not saying that you're going to give, and then you will get back a lot of money in return. Right? He's saying you will find sufficiency in everything. You will be blessed in every way. And uh, and in being blessed in every way, you will have an abundant supply to do all uh, or every good work that God calls you to. Uh, so when we're giving funds, uh, not to expect that we're just going to get back a lot of money, rather to just believe that God is going to bless us in every way. He's going to take care of all of our needs and he will supply whatever is needed for us to be to continue to be a blessing, to continue to do his work. Uh, and then verse 8, he has dispersed abroad, he's given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Um, so that is a reference to Psalm 112. Um, if we can just read, or, or I'll just, uh, or someone, if someone can read Psalm 112, verse 5, and then we connect that to what this says. Psalm 112, verse 5. A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Thank you. So we see in uh, Psalm 112, those first few verses are describing a righteous person. And uh, verse 5 talks about the generosity of that person, uh, of a righteous person who will lend their money freely, who will conduct their affairs with justice. So it's one of the things about righteous person. So if you look at that psalm, there are different things that are said about the righteous person. And one of the things is generosity. And uh, so the blessings that come upon that person also are an overall blessing. It's not uh, only in one area of their life. Um, and so when we read Psalm 112, 9, it's talking about that righteous person who is righteous in every way, who is also generous. Uh, that he has dispersed, he has given to the poor, uh, and his righteousness will be an eternal righteousness, not a righteousness just for his lifetime. It's going to be a blessing for generations to come, uh, and his horn will be exalted with honor. So, uh, using that passage to say that you will be blessed as scripture has promised, you can trust in the promises of scripture that you will be blessed in every way and you uh, will be blessing generations to come as well in these in this giving uh from here let's go on to verses 10 to 15. 
someone can read that, please. The wicked will see it and be grieved. It will gnash its teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. Uh, no, from uh, sorry, uh, from chapter nine, verses ten to fifteen. Second Corinthians, chapter nine, verses ten to fifteen. Sorry. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God for the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God while through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men and by their prayer for you who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Thank you. Uh so uh, we see here that Paul is going back to remind them that God is the one who supplies uh, our needs. So he says uh, in verse 10, he supplies seed to the sower. So even though you are the one sowing, uh, the fact is that God himself has given you that seed to sow. Uh, so the way we look at our finances is that God has entrusted these finances to me. Uh, and I need to be sowing it in a way that God that pleases God. Uh, whatever I'm doing with it, whether I'm investing it for my own purposes, for my family, whether I'm spending it on different things or whether I'm giving it to people, how am I sowing what God has entrusted to me, uh, what God has blessed me with? Um, and he says he supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. So. Uh, the seed is that initial thing that is put in uh, and the bread is the product of what is what comes out of the seed right so he not only gives us that seed to sow but he also gives us that finished product that food uh, that will nourish our bodies that will uh, meet our physical needs uh, so remember as we are dealing with finances that uh, that this is the God we serve. Uh, he is the one who supplies our needs in every way, right from start to finish, he's the one who supplies our needs. And so he will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. So uh, he, he will increase what you are, what is available to you to sow, and he will also increase the harvest uh, that comes from what you're sowing. Right. So uh, when we are looking at this as we are giving, we look at both aspects of it, that there will be an increase in what we have to give and there will be an increase in the blessings that come out of what we have given, what we have sown. Um, and it's uh, what is beautiful about this is in verse 10 is the harvest of your righteousness. Right. It's not just uh, a harvest of crop. It's not a harvest of money, it's a harvest of uh, our own uh, righteousness, our own standing with God will uh, improve and be blessed uh, as we are giving. Uh, and that will happen not only for ourselves, but for other people, there will be a harvest of righteousness. Uh, verse 11, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Uh, again, this uh, reminder that the blessing is an overall blessing it's not only going to be a financial blessing it's a blessing of every need of every uh, every aspect of our lives so that we can be generous in every aspect of our lives whether it is in mercy in kindness in helping others in uh, serving others in every way that we will experience god's generosity towards us and then we will be able to be generous towards others um, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving 
to God. Um, so the end result is that God himself is being praised. Uh, when we are giving to people, uh, it results in praise to God. Um, verse 12, uh, the service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. So as we are giving, we are giving with an attitude of gratitude to God. Right? Uh, like what we said, that whatever we have, we recognize God has given us. And so when we are able to share that with others, we are saying, we are uh, giving it with that thankfulness to God. Thank you, Lord, for what you have blessed me with, and thank you for this opportunity to share it with others, to be able to bless somebody else with what you have given me. So thank you for blessing me so that I can bless others. So it's an expression of gratitude to God, and it results in gratitude to God as well because the other person uh, will thank God on uh, because of what we have done. And then verse 13, uh, because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. Uh, uh, again, here, uh, an important thing to remember that our faith uh, should result in works of faith. Right in things that actually are evidence of the things we believe. So if we believe that God is our provider, uh, then how are we reflecting that in the way we deal with the things that he's given us? Uh, how is our generosity, how is our uh, willingness to share with others reflecting the fact that we believe God is our provider? Uh, so our faith should be evidenced in our work. And so it says uh, here, others will praise God because they see your obedience, they see your generosity, uh, that you not only believe, you've not only accepted the gospel, but that uh, that is impacting the way you live. And you are uh, actually living in a way that reflects that gospel of Christ. Um, and then verse 14, in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Uh, so not only will they thank God, but they will also bless you. And they will pray for you. Uh, uh, they will remember you when they are praying, when they are thanking God because of the grace that God has given you to bless them. Uh, right? So when we are blessed by somebody and we go to God with gratitude, uh, our heart is also then to uh, remember that person who has blessed us and to remember them before God. And so he says that is an additional blessing that you will receive where people will remember you in prayer. Uh, and then verse 15, thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. Uh, so uh, here Paul is... Um, is just kind of bringing all of this giving, teaching on giving together. Uh, he's reminding them that it is actually a blessing to give. Uh, at the end of this giving, you are the one who is being blessed with this indescribable gift, right? You uh, have things that were blessed, that were given to you by God. Uh, they're not things that you yourself have somehow uh, received by your own strength or wisdom. It's things God has given you. You have the opportunity to bless others. And as you bless others, you are being blessed. Uh, God is being glorified. And you share in the gospel of Christ, in the example of Christ, uh, which was uh, this act of generosity of Christ himself giving his life for our sakes, for the world. Uh, and so we get to uh, be a part of that and to lift that out of the way we uh, we deal with our finances, the way we deal with the things that God has blessed us with and how we use those things. Um, so any thoughts, anyone wants to share anything from what we've covered so far?
any thoughts on finances, whether how we use it personally or in ministry, uh, something that we've looked at today, something that uh, you can take away from that. Yeah, I think there's a lot of takeaways that that I got from this class. Um, like how you said, uh, giving from the place of uh, surrendering to God is one of the new thing I have heard. And um, even the point where you said by giving to the same, there is a, a sharing in the sufferings of uh, each other. Uh, mostly, um, I think of a way only giving to church, which uh, which might have been a little wrong. <laughs> we are also sharing with the saints, and uh, we are taking care of their needs. So um, the those are some of the few points um, that I have learned. Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone else want to share anything before we move on to chapter ten? Okay, let's uh, move on then. But uh, just a yeah, just a quick thing of uh, I think these um, chapters just really uh, are a great teaching on how in ministry we both deal with finances, we talk about finances, and how as believers as well we uh, we. Um, we use our finances or how we uh, employ our finances, right? So it is uh, from a ministry perspective as well from as from a believer's perspective and how as ministers we can talk to people about finances. Uh, very, uh, it's a very good and holistic teaching, I think, on finances uh, for us. So uh, it's by the example of the ministers, of the leaders that we, uh, can lead others to deal with their finances. So when people are saying, how are we as a ministry, how are we as leaders uh, using our finances, uh, then they are encouraged to follow our example or to uh, approach their finances in a similar way. So how are we setting an example as ministers and leaders? So uh, from here, we'll go on chapter 10 so uh with chapter 9 was the conclusion of paul's teaching on giving and uh, encouraging the church to prepare uh, their gift for the church in jerusalem and then in chapter 10 he goes on to talk about some of the issues uh, again uh, that were coming up with the people who were opposing him uh, and to uh, encourage uh, some right understanding and right teaching uh, for the Corinthians. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so maybe we'll just do the first six verses. If someone can read that, please. Now, I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ, who is, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent, am bold towards you. But I beg you that when I'm present, I may not be bold with that. confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who Thank you. 
the paper got disconnected from the call. Um, so we'll just uh, read and discuss simultaneously. Um, so uh, Paul says, uh, by the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. Uh, so Paul is sharing in those uh, those qualities of Christ, meekness and gentleness of Christ. Uh, so um, he wants to uh, come to them with that uh, that kind of approach, rather than one who is bold uh, in the eyes of the world. Right. So when we hear those words, meekness and gentleness, they uh, usually from the outside are looked at as weakness, as someone who uh, can be uh, taken for granted or someone who uh, is very weak. Right. But here he is using that as words to describe Christ and he is coming to them with that attitude of uh, meekness and gentleness. Uh, and then he talks about uh, what other people have been saying about it. So he says, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold toward you when away. So this seems to be what other people were saying uh, about him, uh, maybe because he had gone and met them uh, and addressed those issues with them. And then afterwards, he'd gone away and sent a letter to them. So some people were talking against him in that way uh, but he says in verse 2 i beg you that when i come i may not have to be as bold uh, as i think as i expect to be towards some of you who think that we live by the standards of this world so that is an important thing standards of this world right so when uh, the people were looking at him they were judging him uh, this was something that we see repeatedly in his letters to the Corinthians not to judge by the standards of this world so if he was being gentle towards them if he was being humble uh, it was the way of Christ he was following the way of Christ but if he was to follow the ways of the world uh, then he would be like the other leaders the opponents who were coming against him who wanted to post who wanted to uh, put other people down who were putting Paul down uh, as the leader of the church, they had come in and they were putting him down. So um, he could be like that. He could be someone who was bold and confident and uh, putting other people down. And uh, like uh, like Jesus talks about, the rulers of this world lord it over the people, right? They, lord, they take their authority and dominate over their subjects. So he could have been like that, but that was not the way of Christ. And uh, so he chose to not follow in that way. And then verse 3 says, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Uh, so he's not going to go against these opponents uh, with that same attitude of boasting or uh, or talking against them in the way that they are doing it against him. Uh, verse 4, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Um, so we use weapons that have a power that is divine. So we don't have to resort to uh, using our words. We don't have to resort to using our authority, uh, our, um, our strength. We don't have to resort to using influence, using money. We don't have to use the ways of this world. Uh, we depend on God to break down the strongholds, to break down things that are standing against us, uh, to see victory in whatever area we're fighting against, to see uh, victory in that area. Uh, and then we see verse 5, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Um, so uh, he's talking about using spiritual weapons rather than 
physical worldly weapons or using weapons of the flesh. Uh, so we'll talk more about this next week. Uh, but that is his approach, that we are going to approach this battle uh, as a spiritual battle, and we will fight it with spiritual tools rather than with physical fleshly tools. Um, and then uh, that last part is to bring to obedience, uh, bring people to obedience and punish those who have been disobedient. Uh, so we'll talk more about this next week. Uh, that'll be our last class next week. So we'll try and finish up all our content. And I'll also be posting this week. So please be able to talk with it. Thank you. Thank you.